This video is about how I do my job, and if I've done this right, by the end of this, you should be able to do it too. It's also sponsored by Skillshare. More on that later. On the 24th of April 1957, the BBC broadcast what would turn out to be the first episode in the longest-running science TV show of all time, The Sky at Night. For many people, in the UK at least, the monthly half-hour show was the kind of thing they thought of when the idea of science communication was brought up. Elsewhere you may think of Cosmos by Carl Sagan, for example. But that term, science communication, is a little nebulous. Especially now, SciCom, for short, is about much more than just TV shows. You have people like Hank Green making TikToks answering questions about science. You have authors like Rebecca Skloot producing books like The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And you have YouTuber academics like Jordan Harrod making videos about topics in their research. Hell, this YouTube channel, my job, is all about communicating science. But what is that? And how do you do it? SciCom, for short, is now an academic field with qualifications available and professional lecturers and professors teaching the subject. And I want to be clear that I am not professionally qualified in the same way that those lecturers are. This video is just based on my personal opinion, informed by me being trained as a scientist and having done this job of visual science communication for several years now. One definition of science communication is an activity that aims to enhance public scientific awareness, understanding, literacy, and culture by building AEIOU responses in its participants. AEIOU, standing for Awareness, Enjoyment, Interest, Opinion Forming, and Understanding, and has nothing to do with Old MacDonald or his farm. That's a lot of words and concepts all in one go, so perhaps it's best if we briefly go back to those examples that I gave you to see how that definition and those outcomes apply. So, the sky at night aimed to increase awareness of different astronomical phenomena with a little bit of understanding thrown in. Hank Green on TikTok is making science more interesting by making it more enjoyable. Rebecca Skloot is increasing awareness of a certain aspect of science and improving the public's ability to form an opinion on the social and ethical side of research. While Jordan Harrod here on YouTube is increasing awareness and understanding of certain topics in machine learning. So, if you want to be the next Hank Green, you set your objective of increasing awareness and enjoyment of science, and you just do it really well. Right? No. In my opinion, it's not enough to just look at these outcomes. In order to understand science communication, you really have to understand another related concept that is key to how I do all of my work. Science capital refers to science-related qualifications, understanding, knowledge about science and how it works, interest, and social contacts. In simple terms, science capital is how into science you are. So that could be through formal qualifications like degrees, or it could be from knowing somebody who works in the science industry and knowing a bit about what they do. Or it could be enjoying hearing about science in YouTube videos or podcasts. A low science capital individual might not have gone to university and enjoys watching vlogs on YouTube in their spare time, while a high science capital individual might have a PhD in a science subject and enjoys listening to nerdy podcasts like More or Less or Why Aren't You a Doctor Yet? To me, the definition of science communication provides the why, while the definition of science capital provides the how. The two concepts are inextricably linked when talking about practically doing SciCom. Why am I suddenly outside? That's because I want this part of the video to really stick in your brain. And I want that to happen because I'm about to hit you with the two big ideas. Firstly, the ultimate objective of science communication is to increase the level of science capital of its audience. And secondly, and more interestingly in my opinion, that effective science communication needs to be tailored to an initial level of science capital. Perhaps it's easiest to explain these by going back one more time to these examples. So who is the sky at night aimed at? People who are already interested in astronomy, so a relatively high science capital audience, who by the end of the show will hopefully be aware of some topics in astronomy that they weren't before. Meanwhile, on TikTok, Hank Green is aiming for a low science capital 
audience. He's aiming for the average young person scrolling through their For You page and just every now and again likes being hit by a little nugget of science. By the end of one of his videos, that audience will think of science as being more interesting and more enjoyable. And then to give one more example, in The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, Rebecca Skloot is aiming for kind of a middling science capital audience, the average non-fiction reader, who by the end of the book will have been given enough information about cancer science and the relevant social factors to have formed an opinion on quite a complicated bit of science. And of course you can get more granular than this. Within low science capital you have some people that are actively hostile towards science. You have some people that just might not have heard of a particular topic or concept before. And some people that might be interested in science but just don't have very much knowledge or understanding. Time to tell you how these concepts are linked in practice. My personal philosophy for producing SciComm is this. Firstly, Pick a learning objective. How do I want my audience's science capital to have changed by the time I'm finished? Secondly, pick an initial level of science capital. So who is my audience? Am I aiming for people who are already interested in a topic or people who I would like to interest in a topic? And then thirdly, the really difficult step, pick the format. So the TV, film, YouTube video, book, whatever, and the style that maximizes the probability of my chosen audience reaching my chosen learning objective. Easy. Once you have this concept of what your project is, it's then a simple question of communicating your ideas to your audience in the most engaging way possible, which is ultimately a question of storytelling. This is actually a whole video on its own, but suffice to say for now that education is storytelling. This makes it sound very simple, but of course it's not. It's very hard. It's taken me years to get to where I am now, and I fully acknowledge that I am decades behind some other people in this field. With that said, let's go back and look at some of my old projects and see how I put these concepts into action. My PhD vlog series. For those of you who are new to the channel, you may not know that I vlogged the process of getting my PhD at the University of Exeter. The explicit intent with these videos was to target a low science capital audience that just logs onto YouTube to watch vlogs as mindless entertainment. By watching my vlogs, they were hopefully entertained, but also informed about how science is done, and about my research topic in particular. Nowadays, many of my videos are video essays, like the recent one on the Tongan shockwave. This is aiming for a middling to high science capital audience, so there's nothing terribly complex in these videos, and they're constructed to match what other popular science channels on YouTube are doing. The logic being that the audience that watches those videos is the level I want to reach. Sometimes, however, I do a more detailed science-based video, like the one last year on building an AI to play Warhammer 40,000 against. This is definitely aimed at a higher science capital audience, but there's an interesting bifurcation. It's partly aimed at people who want to see an application of machine learning, but also at people who are just into Warhammer and interested, if not terribly knowledgeable, about science. This is the kind of video that I find particularly interesting, because you're kind of luring people in with the promise of something they're interested in, but then introducing them to a scientific aspect of it, or an angle on the subject. And that means that you're kind of operating at two different levels of science capital, one quite low and one relatively high. Another example of this would be my Sci-Fi Planet series with Dr. Hannah Wakeford, a series that was very intentionally constructed with the idea of learning objectives and science capital in mind. But these are all still just videos. What about an entirely different format? Well, let me now introduce you to a project that I've been working on for a couple of months with some seriously talented friends. And that's doing something that, as far as we know, is completely unique. <gasps> the RP Geeks! We spent so long trying to come up with the name for the RP Geeks. 11 points of piercing damage. I only had eight hit points remaining, <gasps> so... How did you only have eight? Because you did ten you points of damage. Oh, like you! The RP geeks like to take the best bits of Dungeons and Dragons and the best bits of science and combine them together. And hopefully, if you're interested in one, you'll be interested in what we're doing. My name's Ali Jennings. My name's Simon. Hi, I'm Emily Bates. Uh, so I'm Charmony. D and D five E is a fantasy rule set 
It's a game that wants you to do dragons and magic and all that kind of stuff. And we say, there is no magic. Um, you can do everything that you can do in 5e, as long as you can explain how it would plausibly work. Understanding the science behind leveling up in D&D. &D. So how do you, well, how do you explain? Five minutes. <laughs> how do you explain the science of leveling yeah. up? What is Go, your explanation? Justify huh. it. I play Infinite Skies 6000, who is a terraforming druid droid. Excuse me, you seem like you might be in charge here. Um, I'm Infinite <laughs> Skies 6000, serial number 86919726, PMGB 1530ML, and I was just wondering if you could tell me what's going on. And her emotional suppressor is broken, so she is feeling things for the very first time. At the moment, happiness and love, but um, we'll see. <laughs> She's getting angrier. <laughs> catches sight of you and narrows their eyes. <laughs> they reach out and tug the shirt uh, sleeve of the person I, next they, to them. Before they do that, can I just try? Just like taking one hand off the rope and being like... Roll a persuasion <laughs> check. Thank you. I'm very, I'm very persuasive. Um, that was a 25. Yes. What? <laughs> now she rolls well. I play Tenebris. Um, according to the character sheet, uh, she's a drow sorcerer. Obviously, we have explanations for her mysterious magical powers. Um, and rather than a drow, uh, she you know, has a dark past. It's all very mysterious. Also, Simon, key points. I hope you've learned how to use them. Yes, I know which ones are my key points. Uh, I think it's dex and strength. No. no. You know that. Right, okay. Stop it, stop it. Don't make me so. nervous that I have. <laughs> In the campaign, I play Uriel Boson, who is a dwarf monk, who uh, has basically, in our version of the D&D rules, uh, is a human who has been cybernetically enhanced. So he's actually more similar to a dwarf and he's tough and resistant to things, but he also knows about metalwork. Um, and he's on an interesting journey of transitioning, if you like, from being human to being more machine than man. In front of you, there are six tables. So a row of three and a row of three behind that. And then behind those is the bar. It sounds like you're describing a battle map. That's yeah, that's very specific, yes. isn't it? Yeah, like, I'm like, I can really picture that. What is a dungeon master? What isn't a dungeon master? Basically the person who makes the entire world. And then they ask the players to come in and explore that world. Our characters arrive in a place called Val, which is a mining colony that sits just in the shadow of these mountains. They're asked to find some smugglers and stop them. They travel up to the mine looking for these smugglers. They get attacked on the way by some sort of huge bird. It's not clear why the bird is so large, but they get attacked and survive. They make their way down into the mines, picking up clues as to what might be happening. They get attacked and deep down, buried there, they find something very strange. A wall of unearthly radiance. When they reach this wall, they find two of the smugglers trying to do some sort of ritual. They try and stop them, they fail. And which is one of the beauties of D&D is that, you know, you can try and do something, you can try and be telling a story a certain way, but how the dice go, what the characters decide to do, you don't know, they could fail. And then they ran and this wall emitted this burst of radiant heat and light, melting things, bringing down the whole cavern, fell down a ravine, again, completely unexpected and then ended up um, meeting some fish people uh, and being ejected down into the forest. And from there, via a few scrapes, they've eventually made it back uh, to the place where they began. But they've, in doing so, they've learned a huge amount more about the world and about what's going on inside. And since we recorded these interviews, there has been yet more story, including us hijacking a spaceship made of enamel that we naturally called the Tooth Fairy. The learning objective here is to make science more enjoyable and more interesting, increasing awareness across a wide range of subjects. Our audience is low science capital, people who just like tabletop and role-playing games. Just like my Planets videos, that is what initially interests people. And the way we talk about the science is hopefully what makes people stay and what increases their science capital. So the RP Geeks go live every Wednesday on Twitch at 7pm on twitch.tv forward slash Dr. Simon Clark. And then we're on many social media networks at RP Geeks DND.
We've been running this project under the radar for quite a few months now as we've been tinkering and working out what format works best. And now we're really happy with it, hence why I'm sharing it with you all. Science is fundamental to the way we live our lives. And a public that is aware of, interested in hearing about, and knows enough about to form opinions on science is a public that makes smarter decisions, that funds further research to push our knowledge even further, and lives a more fulfilled, wonder-filled life. That's why this is important, and it's why if you're talking about science, you have to think about how you're doing it. What is your learning objective? Who are you trying to reach? And how can you reach them most effectively? Once you've worked all of this out, all you need to do is tell them a story. So education is storytelling. And that means that if you want to educate, you have to learn how to tell a good story. And by that, I don't mean being engaging on camera. I mean, learn how to structure a good story. There is an art form with an established set of effective conventions that you won't even notice if they're applied properly, like in early Game of Thrones, but are really noticeable if they're not applied properly, like in late Game of Thrones. Traditionally, you'd learn these conventions at an expensive film school, but now they're accessible to everyone. For example, writer and actor Joshua Dickinson teaches the fundamentals in his beginner-friendly course on Skillshare, this video sponsor. Josh talks through concepts like the three-act structure, conflict, and character arcs that you may think are only relevant to movies and novels, but I can assure you are fundamental to telling a good story in non-fiction too. Now you could be forgiven for thinking, great, another service I have to pay for. But Skillshare is offering my viewers a 30-day free trial. And in that time, you will find course after course on subjects that you've always wanted to learn, but you've never quite got around to trying. There's Jazza teaching illustration, Brett Harned teaching project management, and my friend Ali Abdal showing you how to create a side hustle. While you may have a specific skill in mind that you want to develop, like, say, storytelling, if you're anything like me, you'll spend a bit of time on Skillshare and see several courses where you think, oh, I've Ashley always wants to learn how to do that. The first 1,000 people to go to the link in the description will get themselves a free month of Skillshare. An amazing opportunity to pivot in your career, develop a skill like revision, or simply follow your creative curiosity. Check out that link in the description, and thank you again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really hope you enjoyed this one and all of these recent videos as they're getting a bit bigger and a bit more ambitious now that I have more time thanks to my lovely editor helping me out. Here's some recommended viewing next. If you're not already, please do subscribe to the channel so you get notified when new videos come out. And if you enjoyed this video, please do pop it a like. That just leaves me to say thank you again for watching and I'll see you in the next one.